Now, just a minute past 10 o'clock. Thank you so much for keeping it UBC TV. This is News Tonight. My name is Patricia Lokoma, and in sign language, we'll be shortly joined by Mugalu Mohammed. Fast though, the headlines. Samuel Kazimba is Archbishop. The Electoral Commission 35,000 polling stations are up for 2020-2021. Uganda Airlines starts Juba operations. And in sports, Uganda Open Golf Tani and ranking status. Well, let's get started. Bishop Samuel Kazimba of Mitiana Diocese is the new Archbishop of the Church of Uganda. He was elected by the House of Bishops at St. Paul's Cathedral, Namirembe Diocese in Kampala. Kazimba becomes the ninth Archbishop of the Church of Uganda. He will be enthroned on the 1st of March 2020. <laughs> All eyes were on St. Paul's Cathedral, Namirempe, this Wednesday, as the House of Bishops gathered to elect a new Archbishop. After two hours of closed-door voting exercise, the bishops emerged from the cathedral to announce Samuel Kazimba of Mitiana Diocese as the new Archbishop of the Church of Uganda. <laughs> The Right Reverend Edison Erigay, the Dean of the Province, delivered the news. Today the House of Bishops elected the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Kazimba Mugalu. Archbishop elect Samuel Kazimba Mugaru welcomed the new calling and pledged to take on the responsibility. I trust God who has been with me as a lay reader, a catechist in 1985 and calling me to be ordained and made me a bishop and now an archbishop. He just same God yesterday, today and tomorrow he's going to lead me. And I'm inviting all people to pray for me so that we can work together for this church. He applauded the house of the bishops for entrusting him with the top office in the Church of Uganda. And the main thing I want to concentrate on is the conversion, as Martin Luther emphasized it, conversion of the head, conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the heart. Once people are transformed, the mind, the attitude, the emotions, that is the heart, the hands will work together and, and will help each other. Archbishop Stanley Tagali, who has served as the eighth Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, described the election of Kazimba as the will of God. Ntagali pledged his support to the Archbishop elect. I am retiring uh, in six months time from full time work, being in an office, but I will not retire from preaching the gospel. One who retires from preaching the gospel when God calls you home. So I'll be preaching the gospel, I'll be doing ministry when the Archbishop calls me up, uh, calls me and the bishops and the clergy 
Beatrice Santagali, wife to the outgoing Archbishop, is among those who congratulated Archbishop-elect Samuel Kazimba Mugaru. You know, having a success elections is not easy. I want to tell you, my husband has been saying, I, I don't campaign to anyone, but I want my God, whom I am serving, to elect the one who will repress me. And he has been doing it. I was asking him several times, but he didn't mention NNM. You see the point? He didn't. So the successful of today is also an excitement to my side. Kazimba's election comes six months to the compulsory Church of Uganda constitutional retirement age of Stanley Lentagali at 65 years, which will be March next year. This means Ntagali will still remain the serving Archbishop till 1st March 2020, the day the Archbishop-elect will be enthroned. For UBC TV News, I am Philip Aguta. Now still with the new Archbishop, uh, Stephen Kazimba is the Archbishop uh, for the Church of Uganda. Uh, Kazimba has been elected by the House of Bishops from 37 dioceses of the Church of Uganda. The 57-year-old Bishop has been the Bishop of Mitiana uh, Diocese. Kazimba, whose name literally means a builder, succeeds Archbishop Ntagale as the ninth Archbishop of the Church of Uganda of the the congregation. His calling started in teaching at the Sunday school children in November 1979. After his confirmation, he started, he started his ministry while in secondary school. He then joined Madudu Church Choir in 1980. Later on, he served in this church as the catechist uh, from 1981 to 1983. 1st January 1984, uh, Stephen made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. His hope was revived and since then his zeal is to make Christ known by word and example. He always says, God has raised me from a heart to a state house, from nowhere to somewhere, from nobody to somebody, from grass to grace, and from shame to fame for the gospel. Stephen Kazimba was born to Mr. Besweri Kadu and Miss Jessica Nanyonjo on 15th August 1962 at Gulama Najachagwe. He was the first son of Jessica and Besweri. He was named after his grandfather Kazimba, who served as a lay leader in Chinoni, Kasoga Parish and Gulama Nyenga Parish. Stephen grew up with his mother at Machindie, who took the responsibility of his primary education in Gakuwewa Munno Nursery and Lusaka Primary School. He was baptized by the Canon Y Bado Choir on 22nd April 1973 at St. Luke, Chibuye. He was then confirmed by the Bishop Mizairi Kauma on the 22nd of September 1979 at Namataba Chagwe. His calling started in teaching the Sunday school children in November 1979 after his confirmation. He started his ministry while in secondary school. He joined Madudu Church Choir in 1980. Later, he served in this church as the catechist from 1981 to 1983. Stephen Kazimba got married to Margaret Nagaibulia. They are blessed with four boys, Chisacha Moses Mugaru, Musazi Enok Kazimba, Muwanguzi Peter Cheswa, and Kwagala Joseph Kazimba. On 1st January 1984, Stephen made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. In 1985, he was trained as a lay leader at Baskerville Theological College in Gogwe and posted to Lugazi St. Peter's Church. In 1988 to 1990, he trained at Uganda Matters Seminary and ordained in December 1990 by Bishop Livingstone Mpalanyi Koyoyo. In 1990 to 1994, he served as the assistant vicar at Nachibizi Parish. In 1994 to 1996, he completed his diploma in theology at Bishop Taka College and posted to Kate and Te Parish as parish priest from 1997 to 2000. In 1999, he was then transferred to Mukono Cathedral as vicar in 2000 to 2001. And here he was made acting provost of Mukono Cathedral by Bishop Michael Senyemba after his provost Kanon Matovu had been made bishop of central Buganda diocese. 
In July 2002 to 2003, he completed his master's degree in theology at Western Theology Seminary in USA. In 2004, he was confirmed as the provost of the St. Philip and Andrews Cathedral. In 2004 to 2007, Stephen pursued his doctorate of ministry at Western Seminary USA and was also made a canon in 2007 by Bishop Elia Paul Luzinda Chesiton. He became the fourth bishop of Mitiana Diocese on the 26th of October 2008, replacing Bishop Dr. Danston Caporiano Bukenya. <laughs> Now that's the biography of our newly elected Archbishop. Now still with the Archbishop here, we do have a dialogue. Uh, and of course, as we talk about the elections of the Archbishops, the way they are done, it is in secrecy. And most people have no idea of what takes place uh, you know, inside the voting room. Our very own Michael Jordan Lukoma, in an exclusive interview, uh, you know, had a dialogue with Reverend uh, Canon William Ogang. And here he is as he sheds some light uh, on a wider range of issues regarding the electoral process, as we hear in this discussion. A very good evening to you watching GBC TV. Thank you so much for keeping it with us. Now, this day, the 28th of August 2019, is another day uh, written in our history how uh, the, ch church of the, provi the provincial church of Uganda has today gotten the news of the new archbishop, the ninth archbishop of, uh, to take the stewardship of the church. And that's none other than the right reverend Dr. Stephen Kazimba, who has been who is still the current uh, bishop of Mitiana Diocese, the Anglican Diocese. He has been elected by the House of the Bishops, and he will take the mantle uh, when the official date comes. That will be uh, somewhere next year. First uh, March. First March next year, 2020, when Archbishop Ntagali will officially hand over to him. We want to know, how is this election held? And we shall look at other things. I have the Provincial Secretary of the Church of Uganda, and that is the Reverend Canon Captain William Ongeng. Good evening, sir. Good evening. We are so honored to have you. Thank you. How do you look at this day, 28th August 2019? This day is very special. The reason why I'm saying it is very special is a day that we have been praying for. Okay. Since uh, 2018, in the pro 24th Provincial Assembly, that was held at uh, UCU Mukono, uh, when His Grace, the Archbishop uh, Stanley Tagale, uh, announced publicly that on 1st March 2020 he will retire. Then constitutionally it required that uh, an election be held to replace him. And uh, this election, uh, which is uh, held today, had been prepared for some times back because if an archbishop, the sitting archbishop, uh, declares his uh, intention to uh, retire. Preparations to bring in a new one. Preparations to bring in a Start new one. Right Starts away. right away from the dean of the province. What happens on that day? What Do happens people submit in their CVs? <laughs> Do people show interest, express interest for this post? Because it becomes a vacancy advertised exactly. in our form of view of employment. Exactly. So do people submit in their interest? How do we get the candidates? Now, when that day comes, like today came, what they first do is to gather at the cathedral. By constitution, this election is not done anywhere. It's done at the provincial constitution, which is St. Paul Cathedral, Namirembe. Mm -hmm which is here in Kampala. Mm. And when that day comes, then they have what they call the Holy Communion. They go in, they pray, they have their Holy Communion. You, do you understand a Holy Communion? Yes. When you understand what a Holy Communion is, it's the gathering of believers mm. sharing the body of Christ yes. to show their solidarity. Mm. So now when it is done, when the Holy Communion is done, then the Chancellor of the province, who is a lawyer by profession, it becomes the chair of the house of the business. Okay. So when he sits on that chair, and uh, no other person is allowed there apart from only the bishops, mm. 
and him as the chair. Even me, the provincial secretary, I don't sit there because I'm not a bishop. Because that is the House of Bishops' business. So from there, then the constitution say, if that vacancy is there, they will choose among themselves one. So which means the one, how they arrive at it, is how they vote inside there. Now I'm already worried. What for? Because... <laughs> Because being that you also locked out, yeah. no, it is not. Yet I want out. to know how now they come to arrive to that very first per ah. that one person like now Doctor Kazimba today. That is the question. Where I, I what happens? Do, uh, have you ever like peeped inside and know? No, no peeping. Mm. No peeping. These things are very clear. The constitution say when the chancellor sits there, then they they give nominations of names. Who nominates these names? The bishops themselves. I stand up to nominate you, my fellow bishop, if I wish that you become the archbishop. So I may acknowledge your nomination or turn it down? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so. so. Fellow so, bishops nominate colleagues. Colleagues. Okay. I think uh, so and so can, 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 God can use him for our leadership. So they start voting. So, yeah. There is no campaigning of saying, now I want you to vote for me. I want so and so to vote for mm -hmm. No, that is not there. It is about their prayer. Why? Isn't that now against the will of somebody? W what will? Because if you nominate me and you don't want and I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm not even given an opportunity to say something to the electorate democratically and to their issues. Do you know do you know the difference between this and the other one we are talking about, the other political position? Tell us. This one is about service of God. All of them, God has chosen them to serve. And God can give them any position to serve at. Not only to wait and say, I don't want to serve here, I don't want to serve there. Mm. If God calls you, you have the to answer. The answer is answer. supposed to be only yes. Yes, you have to do it. Mm. You have to do it. Even Stephen who has been elected today, he did not even know. He never even campaigned. No bishop reported to us that ah, so and so is campaigning. No. It was about prayer and the Lord led them to give him their wish that Bishop Stephen mm. please take over. But now you are a senior servant in the church. Yes. You should know what are those qualifications that make somebody stand out among all other bishops? Um, that can make somebody an outstanding figure to take this. One purchase. of the things is uh, in our human perspective because you must also have a standard as human beings where you can begin the foundation on which you stand the first thing is a bi that bishop first of all you must be a bishop who is serving mm. that is a, a standing out thing two you must be a bishop who is 50 years and above you must have attained 50 years of age mm. and uh, those, those, those two criteria make every one of them who are 50 and above legible. And you are going to serve for 10 years. You see this? Mm. Now Bishop Stephen says it's 57 years. So he's going to serve only for 80. 8 years. Then it gets to 65. Mm. So your service must take you to the retiring age, which is, we call it in the church, mandatory retiring age at 65 at that very point yes there is belief that anglican church bishops retire so early by the age of 65 somebody still looks very physically strong with an open free mind that can really continuously serve can't this be changed to at least 75 when I somebody at least physically should also retire <laughs> i think it is not yet now because that is what the constitution provides at the moment. If they so wish in future to say we want also to remove the term limit to to age limit to seventy-five, actually something like that <laughs> to seventy-five, it is upon the the, the 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 proposal of the provincial assembly because it is the assembly that has set these rules. Mm. It is not them who has put that rule. What is your view as Canon Ongeng? As Canon Ongeng, mm. I would think Because if you look at uh, the Archbishop retired, Dr. Orombi, 
my good friend. He's a very strong man and he's still preaching. And of course, that was a dialogue between our very own Michael Jordan Lukuma and Reverend Colonel William Ongeng there. He is the provisional secretary. Um, some of the issues that are quite interesting there is the discussion uh, was more about the process of electing an archbishop behind that room. We will be bringing you the detailed interview in our subsequent bulletins. Better still, tomorrow tune in at our lunchtime news. We will be, you know, enlightening you with that. Now turning on to the presidential press unit president, Yoweri Museveni met and held a bilateral meeting with President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya on the sidelines of the Taikat 7 conference in Yokohama, Japan, during which the two leaders discussed issues of sugar and sugarcane exports to Kenya. During a joint a permanent commission meeting in Mombasa last March, it was agreed that Kenya's importation of sugar from Uganda would increase from 30,000 tons to 90,000 tons per annum, but the process has been delayed. Now, according to reports, the importation licenses are issued by Kenya's military, uh, sorry, Ministry of Agriculture, which delays to put the issues out. President Museveni said there is need to fasten the trade process. Uh, President Kenyatta pledged to follow up on this matter. If the deal is settled, Uganda is set to become a dominant sugar exporter within the East African community. Earlier in January, Tanzania cleared importation of Ugandan sugar after a meeting between the two countries. And of course, ministers broke you know, the trade and the deadlock was cleared. During the meeting, the two leaders also discussed bilateral issues affecting their two countries. Now still with the presidential press unit, but on industrial revolution, President Jerem Seveni has called on leaders to concentrate on solving issues that undermine economic productivity by removing cost pushers through improved infrastructures such as roads and railway, uh, electricity and cost of money, saying this will not only improve the cost of doing business in the country, but also attract private investment. This was during the address to the conference plenary held under the theme accelerating economic transformation and improving uh, business environment through innovation and private sector engagement. The president said that the use of machines to do work instead of relying on the muscles of man or beast was the beginning of the first industrial revolution. They then introduced uh, the railway and electricity, lowering the costs of transport and production and supporting big volumes of output and that constituted to the second industrial revolution automation of machines ushered in the third industrial revolution japanese and african leaders from the 50 countries are meeting here at the tokyo international conference on african development TICAD. The three-day event is focused on boosting Japanese private investments in Africa. It's the seventh time the event has been held since the conference began in 1993. And according to reports, the Japanese government wants to use the occasion to unveil a three-year investment package aimed at expanding its presence on the continent. The continent's population is increasing rapidly with the UN projection uh, that stands by 2050. One in four people on earth will be African. Interesting. Its economy has also been on the upswing, growing by around 3% a year. Again, a President Yuri Museveni has said that there is no way Africa can industrialize without solving the issues of lowering cost and doing business, including the provision of improved infrastructure, electricity, cost of money, and equality labor force. Uh, the President was today meeting with the Director General of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, Lee Young, 
who called on him at his residency at the Intercontinental Hotel in Yokohama, Japan, at the sidelines of the 7th Taikat Conference. President Museveni said Africa is slowly addressing the issue of a fragmented market through integration to support industrialization and promoting infrastructure development, including railway, waterways, and electricity. Now, the First Lady and Minister of Education, Janet Museveni, has revealed new policy, legal, and planning frameworks for the sector. They include the Technical Vocation Education and Training, TVET, and the National Teacher Policy to fast-track key reforms in the sector. The ministry is currently holding the 26th Education and Sports Sector Review Workshop, the text talk of all achievements and challenges first during the financial year, 2018-2019. Education stakeholders have gathered to review the sector's performance for the financial year 2018-2019, draw lessons and implement activities for the current financial year 2019-2020. The Minister for Education, Janet Museveni, highlighted successes registered in the sector. They include the construction of facilities in three public universities, and accreditation of 353 out of the targeted 636 programs by the National Council of Higher Education. The Higher Education Students Financing Board also supported 8,190 students to pursue degree and diploma programs under the loan scheme. Other achievements include wins by the cranes during the AFCON Games in Egypt, the sheep cranes during the Netball World Cup and medals won at the World Cross Country Championships. The ministry also provided books and hearing aids to several schools across the country. The minister revealed that City and Guilds International certified courses offered at the Uganda Petroleum Institute Kigumba and Uganda Technical College Kichwamba. Besides, 41 trainers were recruited to support competence-based training. In line with the theme for this year's review, the ministry will continue to strengthen skills development to equip learners with the relevant skills and competences required for gainful employment. The U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, Deborah Malak, represented the Education Partners Group at this sector review. I'm the daughter of a teacher, so I know firsthand the challenges, even in countries like mine, that teachers face in the classroom. They cannot do it alone. They need all stakeholders, from the system to the parents to the communities, to be part of the effort. The Permanent Secretary, Minister of Education and Sports, Alex Kakoza, to look into ways of addressing the existing gaps in the sector. We shall put in place the implementation unit, implementation uh, committees for the policies that are, have been passed by cabinet so that implementation begins as soon as possible. As Her Excellency mentioned, we have already put in place the, an implementation team. The ministry completed the construction of 588 classrooms in 84 schools, 84 administration blocks, 34 latrine blocks of five stanza each, 42 latrine blocks of two stanza each, and rainwater harvester tanks in 84 public primary schools across the country, among other achievements. Remija Simbonye, UBC News in Kampala. Well, let's take a short break, and of course we will return with more news after this. Every dream has a challenging journey. Ours began in 1998 with a mission to drive the development of a robust communications sector in Uganda. We created structures to champion the dream. We've evolved, made discoveries, supported great minds, empowered Ugandans and fostered a vibrant culture enabling communication for all. Down the years, we've created memories and networks, 
uniting generations and building great partnerships. Together, we can go even further. UCC, celebrating 20 years of achievements. Having concluded the regional tours, the Minister of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries in collaboration with Development Partners will conduct the Joint Agriculture Sector Annual Review 2019 on the 29th and 30th of August 2019 at Speak Resort Hotel, Munyonyo. The purpose of the workshop is to review the agriculture sector performance during financial year 2018-2019 and provide guidance in implementation of sector initiatives for financial year 2019-2020. The workshop will bring together policy makers, representatives of local government, civil society organizations and private sector players, farmers organizations as well as representatives of the ministry and its agencies. The workshop will run under the theme Agro-Industrialization for Job Creation and Shared Prosperity. Attendance is by invite only. Have you completed Senior 4 or Senior 6 and you want to do a two-year certificate or a diploma course? Makerere Institute for Social Development and affiliated to Makerere Business School offers programs in accounting and finance, business administration, procurement and supplies management, social work and social administration, information technology, counseling and guidance, human resource, project planning and management, journalism, secretarial studies, and many others. We are located on Sa Apollo Kegwa Road next to Oilcom Petrol Station with a UBTEP Center number. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Pain Arena. Introducing on the right corner Mr. Action, the reigning heavyweight champion in the ring against Guinness the Headache, the number one contender. And the bell rings. Headache charges forward with a steady right and a left hook. Action dodges. He misses out with an inch. Wait a minute. Mr. Action launches back with a kick. The final blow. He is out. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. Welcome to the first ever Uganda-Tanzania Business Forum and Exhibition taking place on the 4th and the 5th of September 2019 at the Julius Nyerere International Convention Center in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Come and explore new business and investment opportunities. Come and participate in open plenary discussions on finance, bilateral trade, infrastructure, extractives and their challenges before the heads of state, government ministers and policy makers as well as showcasing your products and services at the business Business exhibition. Registration is now open. Log on to www.businessforum.biz today and register to participate in the 2019 Uganda Tanzania Business Forum. Call us on 752-470-214 Uganda and for Tanzania 784-323-068. The Uganda Tanzania Business Forum is organized by and is proudly sponsored by This place that will leave you enthralled. Make a date with us during the first Sunday of every month. With over 2,000 participants at one venue, we aim to keep healthy, network, ensure viable brand positioning, and make friends while having fun during our monthly sports festival. The long line hassle with one expert. The power of placing the perfect bet is at your fingertips. Bet anytime from anywhere. Best of all, payment is instant. Place your bet on whatever you choose but your games, bet games, sports, and even live betting. Winning has never been this simple. Bet with one expert. Advanced gaming is regulated by the Lotteries and Gaming Regulatory Board. Betting is addictive and can be psychologically harmful and it's only eligible to persons above 18 years of age.
Welcome back. News Tonight continues. The Electoral Commission is in process of recognizing polling stations for the preparations of the 2021 elections. In the coming election, elections are to be conducted in 35,000 polling stations. This is due to the new districts and sub-counties created recently. The just-launched countrywide reorganizing of polling stations campaign begins September. It will last for two weeks. Thank you very much. The stakeholder-led exercise deers at merging and renaming polling stations, splitting polling stations with voters higher than 900 in rural areas and 1,100 in urban areas. The exercise will also see some polling stations relocated after consulting residents. For example, near bars or located in congested areas like marketplaces or clustered in polling centers without adequate space for polling activities or inconvenient for the population to cast their votes resulting in voters having to travel long distances to vote. Teams will be dispatched to various parts of the country to engage with the locals on issues regarding the electoral process that is verifying with the National Voters Register, acquiring national IDs, among others. Where we have a bigger number of the youth who will be participating in the next election. So this is one of the strategies to capture them and to get uh, vote awareness about our exercise. Ivan Kahua and Sebira Andrew, UBC News. Now several tenants in Chiliam, Chiliam Soke village, Changkwanzi district, are in fear of evictions following the leasing of their land to a Tescano limited company by the former Changkwanzi district land board Mpaji Kajube. This made the inquiry wonder whether Mpaji Kajube was being funded to displace tenants who had occupied the land for a year. The Commission of Inquiry into Land Matters has tasked the former Chankwanzi District Land Board Mpaji Kajubi to explain why he pioneered the land giveaway of over three square miles in Chankwanzi. When these poor people are thinking that uh, somebody is caveating to protect their interest, in actual fact what he was doing was writing to you to say stop processing the applications because there is a new person whose interests we should treat more importantly because he's an investor who's doing projects. What came first was the investor. The former Changkwanzi District Land Board is said to have influenced the payment of the sitting allowance meeting with the investors in regard to the acquisition of the land in contention. What sin did this commit against the law that they should suffer and, 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 and have to deal with a, a chairman like this? It is really, really, really sad. How could you be, be unleashed on these unsuspecting people of Chibok? I beg you for the chunk ones. This is very unfortunate. Really unfortunate. According to the commission, Mpaji Kajubi did what he could to lease the land to investors, even with the engagement of State House. Why we shouldn't accuse you of conflict of interest, of corruption, uh, of being a broker for Toscano, Wanjala, and whatever, because you knew all the claims on this land. But you were there trying to maneuver you. It was alleged that owners of the contested me, land had no powers of transferring the land because their lease had expired. The commission noted that there was no internalization of the law concerning land matters by Changwanzi District Land Board. You see, you assume you know the law, you know the policies. Now, let me tell you, knowledge is very interesting. You, know. you may think you know much, but uh, when you... And by the way... It is alleged that Wilberforce Waka and Jagala applied for 20 acres in Bierima, but in 2003, a one George Wanjara and Elder Din Sereko claimed the land using torture and intimidation, and a life was lost in a shooting with police. Sudat Kaye, UBC News.
Now from the Land Commission over to Makere University, where it's to roll out a scholarship program aimed at supporting financially disadvantaged students across the country. Makere University Deputy Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration Professor William Bazeo says that the initiative requires private partnership. The sister Makere University receives at least 100 students supplying for tuition support annually, which the university said it cannot afford. The students that have performed so well in the schools find it very difficult to get tuition, to get money to take them through universities. So they come to us, and I'm sure they go to other universities. So it's a very big, big challenge. The numbers of the people that deserve or need support are extremely very many. The higher institution of learning is currently forging partnerships with the private sector to support financially disadvantaged students. The universities around the world have some kind of fellowship or scholarship program where you apply and you are admitted on merit and you get a scholarship. Makere University has never had one, so we are in the process of developing ourselves to establish one. So that we get partners, stakeholders, industries, private sector to contribute to this fund. And once this fund is there, it will do many things. It will support research, it will support innovation, it will support development, it will support students to get partial or full scholarships who are talented and unable to fund themselves. Bazeo was receiving 25 scholarships from Barclays Bank, which is distributed to different public universities in support of science courses. Not just about the scholarships, uh, it is also about giving them internships once they graduate uh, and then also if they choose to be entrepreneurs, then how can our expertise in the small and medium enterprise help them in, in becoming even better at what they do. This is the second group of beneficiaries in this program, worth 365 million shillings. The scholarship is an annual commitment aimed at availing quality education and psychosocial support to promising but financially challenged students in Uganda. I would do Nasili Luwama for UBC News. Now, Lodonga Basilica is a beautiful brick and mortar church in Kerwa, sub county Yumbe district. It was built around 1927 and it is the pioneer basilica south of the Sahara. Though Yumbe district is 85% Muslim, it is the pioneer district to have a church at the level of basilica in the country and the oldest church in the West Nile. Though Uganda has since got two more basilicas at Namgongo and Mionyumata shrines, Ladonga remains unique because it was here that the Virgin Mary appeared to a Komboni missionary, Reverend Father Oni Rasadra. Ladonga Basilica is encircled by primary teachers' college, a primary school, and a hospital. However, the primary school has since suffered years of disrepair. And then the school door had the older facilities with Mabati or iron seas, there was no provision of collecting water. Government, with the support of because development the, response the to displacement UBE, impact project, also known as Dr. And, Deep, uh, has built new structures for Lodonga and Primary School because of its kindness to refugee children. Uh, also, to report to the people of Yume that by the end of this month, 2019, government through Dr. Deep shall release 18 billion Uganda shillings for districts to support environment and livelihood projects, respectively, for Yumbe and other districts. The Minister for Refugees and Disaster Preparedness, Engineer Hero Neck, recently commissioned six classrooms, two water tanks, and laboratories for now, this school. I'm, I'm really forward to congratulate the, the school for increasing the enrollment over 1,400. Really, that's very good because of the expansion of the water. Now, what you are lacking is staff houses. I think you put that in the, your request for the next batch of money because we are still with you for the next five years. So Onek also appealed to response to displacement impact project to repair Rodong Primary School, which is currently accommodating a big population, including refugee children. Make the old buildings, make sure that they look nice. 
renovate the old buildings and then also put the teachers' houses, paint them nicely so that the Donga Demonstration Primary School is a special school befitting the TTPTC, which is here. Yumbe is the leading refugee hosting district in West Nile and home to Bidbidi, the largest refugee settlement camp in Africa. And you can also say thank you to the government, to Dr. Dick Project, and to the district officials. Clap, children, for this. Other districts hosting refugees in West Nile include Ajumani, Moyo, Obonji, Koboko, and Arua. We manage it to secure some resources that are helping to reduce the pressure in refugee hosting districts. And therefore, I want you to join me and we give a loud applause to the donors that are contributing to reducing pressure on resources ranging from education to health, water, and life saving. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Department of Refugees, we thank you for that effort. Western region is hosting a million refugees out of the 1.3 million being hosted in the entire country. Haimana Deo, reporting for BC News. In Wakiso, as we all know, Wakiso is one of the districts in Uganda experiencing the highest degree of wetland degradation in the country. According to the latter state of environment report, Wakiso district is the biggest wetland degrader in Uganda. This kind of degradation is attributed to unplanned urban expansion. Uganda's Environment Watchdog, the National Environment Management Authority, is concerned. They say rampant wetland destruction of this nature risks the entire greater Kampala to life-threatening flooding, increased global warming, and diseases. People, those who went to, to develop that, uh, that area, that estate down there, I'm hardly not sure that they will never have to go to South Authority from the relevant institutions. Wakiso Town Council residents who have settled in the fragile hills of Wakiso have no considerations for NEMA's guidelines. The result is uncontrolled water runoff that impacts on the already degraded lowlands. The issue of erosion that's arising from, the, from up there, uh, it, the law even provides which type of hills you can build. There is a gradient level that is mentioned in the law that can be allowed. You can't build in all hills. Or if you build a hill, you must cut it to the level that it get conforms to that, uh, to, that, to, that, to that slope. And so we avoid the issues of uh, uh, those issues of siltation that's now coming down. Most of the wetlands here have been creamed off by numerous Pentecostal churches, schools and workshops that have been built in the middle of the wetlands and catchment areas. This Maram Road in Wakiso Town Council has been constructed in the middle of the already dwindling wetland, blocking waterways and damming the area. Building a road or wetlands is a permitted activity. It's regulated. That means that when you build a road through wetland, there are many things that you must do. You must build such that the water flow and all those things are not interfered with. So that, uh, as if the swamp is operating in terms of the movement of water and other, other, other biological matter that's in the water. Wetland belts act as sponges, sipping excessive water during rainy seasons and gently releasing it to the atmosphere, making them important flood controllers. But when they are relentlessly destroyed, human safety is threatened. Story compiled by Pathias Karekona and Tanaba Kenneth for UBC TV. Now the KCCA as an authority is to summon Jennifer Musisi Semakula, the former executive director and the former director legal Charles Oma over audit queries that led to the authority to lose about 47 billion Ugandan shillings in legal costs. The acting executive director, KCCA engineer Andrew Kitaka, said they have filed an application in court because these consent judgments were executed without management approval. Kampala Capital City Authority is investigating audit queries from Council Public Accounts Committee of the 47 billion legal costs. 
Chairing the authority meeting, Lord Mayor Arias Rukwago said some of the case files were not forwarded to CPAC to investigate because according to the then executive director, Jennifer Mstise Makula, they had classified information. The amount is 245.7 million. Justin Moral Mudumuero versus KCCA, I can see 259 million. Authority has discovered that all the concert judgments were signed by one person, Charles Souma, the former director legal, without management approval, and we are partial. <laughs> The 14.9 billion shillings paid to Sengendo and Sendege company advocates in legal costs through Ganashi orders for 300 cases is one of those being investigated to ensure value for money. The issue of who has the authority to allow the concert brought a lot of debates. All the problems with the management sitting have been with the consent and then we, we deal with the post mortem. So we can always hear a party it at the stage of the consent. Management should not be entering the process. It is to assume that management has been entering into dubious process, which has been happening. I do not see any problem with management retaining this responsibility. Management consists of very competent people. In our process, there was something that was committed ultimately. Because you find all our concepts don't actually have the signature of the executive director as an accounting officer. Councillors proposed that former ED Jennifer Msisi be summoned to provide details. Can we summon Charles Oumarimo? Uh, it is definitely clear before this authority that an officer here. The accounting officer by then should, should also be summoned to explain our national criminology. And therefore, these people must be taken, investigated by CIDs. The authority has asked the technical team to make a comprehensive report on the root causes of this illegality. I'm Navka Farida, reporting in Kampala. Quickly into business airlines. Uganda Airlines has officially commenced a commercial operations with two flights taking off for Nairobi and Juba, respectively. Our reporter Samuel Sinuno was aboard the Juba inaugural commercial flight and our reports. It is a scene Uganda Airlines jetliners will have to get used to in these first days of the resumption of commercial operations after a long hiatus. At Juba International Airport, government officials led by Uganda's ambassador to South Sudan and the CEO of South Sudan Civil Aviation Authority were in place to officially receive Uganda Airlines flight UR-122. I'm really very happy uh, for the resumption of Air Uganda to South Sudan, we have been longing for all these years. Southern Sudanese citizens will be happy to enjoy this flame. They were also awed by this latest Sierra G900 jetliner from Bombardier, which is currently being flown by Uganda on the African continent. I have never seen such the aircrafts. The public should notice this because the plane who are landing CRG at the same time, 
either 100 or 200. This is now the third series I have seen and all that thing. So I really admire the type of these aircrafts in one of the latest, one of the latest plane. I cannot doubt on, on this issue. Uganda Airlines country manager Moses Chisembo also revealed that the reception among the traveling South Sudan community has so far been noteworthy. So, so far, I've uh, sold ticket their spreads, not like on one flight, eh? their spreads, and now so far I've sold like 50. I've sold like 50, and for me I'm impressed because I can access the system. When I access the system, initially, you could see that you have economy zero, uh, business zero, but now you can find economy five, business one, economy on another flight is ten, two. So it shows that people are responding, people are trickling in, and people are booking. Shortly before takeoff, we caught up with some of the passengers who had booked on the return flight to Entebbe. So happy and so grateful to be the first, you know, to uh, use uh, Air Uganda. Uh, I can see that this really brings a uh, you know benefit to the two countries, uh, not only two countries but to uh, African continent. From Uganda, so when we have such an airline, it, it is really proud for us. Uganda Airlines will have two direct flights from Entebbe to Juba, and right now a return ticket goes for 180 US dollars, a price that is very low if you to compare to what other airlines that ply this route charge. But experts in the travel industry based in South Sudan argue that it will need a lot more than just slashing the ticket prices if Uganda Airlines is to break even in this rather competitive market. We are not necessarily going to go for it because it's cheap. Cheap is not what is going to cut it. So for the next two months, yes, there is cheapness. But how good is that service going to be? And I think for Uganda, that's something they need to really put forward. Uh, as for me, who will want to fly tomorrow? Yes. It may be that cheap. It's a cheaper right now with most of the air and $100 and below, lower than what Rwanda is offering and all that. But is it worth me losing $100 and being inconvenienced for the service? But again, they have the upper hand. Uganda, uh, our brothers and sisters who live here across with us here, they, they make, I think, if I'm not wrong, the second biggest population of foreigners were in this country. So you already have a very huge big number of people that wants to go directly home. On top of that, I will want to say Uganda is like a second home to most of us here in South Sudan. South Sudan is one of the leading trading partners with Uganda in the region and the airline plans to take advantage of these existing trade ties. Samuel Sanono, UBC News. Thank you very much there, Samuel Senena. Now, the fourth estate has always been a close ally to the judiciary, especially in the fight against graft through publication of news articles that expose perpetrators. Appreciative of the role they play, Justice Lawrence Gidudu, uh, the head of anti-corruption court, wants media to further their work by following up cases to the later as opposed to the mere mention of the cases. According to Justice Gidudu, this is... The press abandons the trial in terms of reporting until judgment day. Justice Gidudu says it is through regular media reports that the public can keep track of the developments on different corruption cases, thereby interest the common man to follow up. Because if we handle cases and they are not reported about, then the country will not know the magnitude of the problem and they will not be able to shun corruption as we wish them to do. However, responding to this call, journalists registered a number of challenges they face in courtrooms, but with the emphasis on the anti-corruption court. We need to take from the terrible vision. We need to take. So if you don't have footage, there is nothing you can do with that story. Because you have to prove to the, to the audience. Journalists shall be receiving information from the communication office and guidance which court is sitting, what case is being heard, and so on. The two-day training for journalists, organized by strengthening Uganda's anti-corruption response technical advisory facility, was running under the theme Citizen Engagement in Uganda's anti-corruption response. Dokas Mono, UBC TV News.
time to look at what's happening in sports and starting off with chess chess player Harold Wanyama won bronze in the individual chess round.